know, the past two years have really made it clear that our systems, especially in housing, are broken. The challenges we faced has helped shine a light on the dire need to build a future where everyone has a stable and affordable place to live. But even with these challenges we have faced, you know, we were not deterred. And as a community, we continue to advance innovative, equity-centered housing solutions. We're transforming systems and making sure that we are building back better. 2021 was a really a banner year for California housing. Due to your advocacy and efforts for an equitable society, the state approved policies and resources for affordable housing and uh, policies and resources that protected tenants. We're excited that we passed the California Housing Opportunity and More Efficiency Act, otherwise known as SB9 or the HOME Act. And this law is a step forward in addressing the racial seg segregation resulting from the single family zoning, allowing for more housing to be built and provides new opportunities for those who make low and moderate income to build wealth. We're also looking forward to the launch of the Housing Accountability Unit, which will help communities meet their housing goals. The unit will ensure communities are taking meaningful actions to combat discrimination and overcome patterns of segregation. With this accountability unit, it's really the first time jurisdictions would be monitored and will put themselves at risk for, uh, at risk of getting public resources if they don't meet their um, RENA goals or their housing goals. While these policies are really a big step forward, we're still facing many barriers to housing our community. Exclusionary jurisdictions are still finding ways to get out of producing enough housing. We saw many Bay Area jurisdictions jump through the hoops to significantly lower their goals. They went and tried to appeal the goals that were set for the community, for their community. We also know that the economic impact of the pandemic and COVID has really created significant hardships for lower income renters. With housing costs rapidly increasing again, it's clear that the housing prices exasperated by the pandemic will continue. This is why the Partnership for the Bay's Future exists though. You know, we're here to help develop these solutions and I'd like to share with you how we've been taking on these challenges. You heard our CEO, Fred, talk a little bit about the Partnerships Policy Fund during his introduction. And as our challenge grants wraps up this month, I'd like to use this opportunity to dive a little bit deeper into the successes we found with this model as well as the lessons we've learned along the way. As you may recall, we launched the challenge grant at the outset of the pandemic in 2020, March, 2020. Um, I had just started just a couple of weeks earlier than that. And you know what we found was that this timing was really a blessing in disguise because as the challenge grants teams started, they positioned themselves to really provide critical support for cities and their communities um, as jurisdictions were mounting initial response to COVID. The fellows were seated in jurisdictions. The fellows we seated in jurisdictions strengthened the jurisdiction's capacity to put emergency housing measures in place. Many of the challenge grant jurisdictions, most notably the city of San Jose, the city of Oakland, the county of Alameda, were really the first to implement tenant protection policies, such as eviction moratoria, expanding tenant protections and putting bans on rental increases. Another great thing that we've learned is that the partnership really facilitated innovative government community collaboration. Fellows such as Asin, who was in San Jose and Brandon in Redwood City added capacity and expertise for developing anti-displacement policies. They served as a bridge to the communities resulting in more inclusive proposals. Community partners like EPA Can Do were at the table in creating policies to preserve mobile home parks with the East Palo Alto city leaders in a more intentional way. We really believe that by involving trusted community partners at the beginning of the effort, the process was more authentic, community involved, and equity centered. You know, the partnership really had this really unique um, hypothesis that if we brought the uh, cities together and created a peer learning model. It would really accelerate the learnings in really important ways. And that really played out. 
You know, the peer learning model allowed jurisdictions to collaborate and co-create as a cohort um, and accelerating policy development and implementation efforts to scale regionally. One of the remarkable examples of this is that our fellow Anna, from, who was with the city of Berkeley, helped to develop the Tenant Opportunity Purchase Act. This would create more opportunities to preserve um, and purchase homes in their community. Um, this work really served as a model and created momentum for three other challenge grant cities, East Palo Alto, San Jose, and Oakland, to propose similar policies. The insights gained from Berkeley shortened the time to develop policies from 18 months down to just four months for some of these other jurisdictions. As you may have heard, we just recently also announced our breakthrough grantees. So this is kind of our next round of partners for this work. We're looking forward to applying what we learned from the challenge grants to these next set of jurisdictions. And we're also so grateful for the many jurisdictions that submitted incredible ideas to more equitably preserve and produce housing in our region. Launching this June, we're incredibly excited about the incoming cohort as they've proposed many inspiring innovative policies, such as equity platforms and community-led equity committees and reparations frameworks. Oakland and San Francisco will be working on efforts to support emerging BIPOC leaders. We have jurisdictions planning to partner with faith-based organizations to convert underutilized land and to empower land trusts to acquire land. We will again be placing fellows in jurisdictions to support this work. And we would love for you to consider serving as a fellow or nominate someone who would be really awesome for this. The deadline is March 9th, and you can find more details on how to apply to become a fellow there. Now, the impacts um, of the policy fund is something that I'm very uh, proud of. As I close, I wanted to celebrate the transformative impact, the housing solutions, and the policies supported by the partnership. You know, the critical support that PBF provided to jurisdictions in their initial response to COVID, such as eviction moratoria and rental assistance, protected over 73,000 tenants from losing their homes. We were able to work on 28 anti-displacement tenant protection and housing preservation policies proposed by jurisdictions. When passed, these can impact almost half a million renters in the Bay Area. 18 local and regional governments have been awarded grants. 50 community organizations have been supported to champion equitable housing policies. And although these numbers are impressive, to me, the most important thing is that together, we are building lasting relationships. We're building trusting partnerships between government and community. Um, and we're doing it in a way that's gonna allow them to pass and intimate, implement policy changes to counter you know, the unfortunate sentiment we hear so often, the NIMBY sentiments, the not in my backyard sentiments. Of course, none of this would be possible without our partners. Beyond their investments, the invaluable leadership from key partners like the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, Genentech, Hewlett Foundation, Meta, the Packard Foundation, the Silicon Valley Community Foundation and the Ford Foundation has helped us to continue to innovate and grow. Because of them, we come together across sectors in the region to coordinate strategy and collectively act to shift the Bay Area towards a vibrant, inclusive community of racial and economic diversity. I'm so excited to be here with you today. And I'm a privilege to introduce one of our key leaders of the partnership, someone who um, you were introduced to earlier, Cindy Wu, Executive Director of the LIST Bay Area. Thank you, Khan. Great to be with you all again. Thanks, Khan, for telling us all the updates about the Policy Fund. So I'd like to tell you now about the progress we have made with the Family of Funds. I want to share ideas about what has led to our success and where we need to go. I also want to highlight the impact measurement via the equity dashboard and talk about the connection between the policy and real estate investment funds. First, the numbers. After raising $500 million in commitments in our first year, we designed two funds, the Base Future Fund here in green and gray and the Community Housing Fund here in yellow. But the bottom line message is we have closed nearly $300 million in loans supporting over 3,300 homes. 
the Bay's Future Fund has helped expand the affordable housing ecosystem, testing out new models that can be scaled and bringing in new players. And we have been able to support emerging developers, diverse developers, community ownership via land trusts, and innovations in design and construction. The second fund, the Community Housing Fund, is $150 million dedicated to respond to the moment and the pressing need for housing for those who are experiencing or at risk of homelessness. But our ambition goes far beyond numbers. We have had equity goals as our North Star from the beginning to create a more racially and economically diverse Bay Area. We developed a framework and methodology for an equity dashboard that is leading the community development finance field. We are proud to report results. We have hit our income targets for the units in the portfolio. A quarter of the homes are for those earning 30% area median income and below, and 90% of the homes are for those earning 80% of area median income and below. Thinking with a racial equity lens, we have really focused on preservation as a strategy. A third of our portfolio, so 10 deals, have been preservation deals, both large scale, 300 units and small, seven units as an example. And through self-reported data, 95% of the tenants in these preservation deals identify as people of color. So how did we do it? Our success was really due to the flexibility we built into fund design. We were able to target the different financial products, lower interest rates as we saw it was needed and respond to needs as we heard them. Some examples include that we changed the guidelines to include rehab only projects or transitional housing projects. Um, we also changed the loan to value guidelines to make it easier for supportive housing projects to get financing. We heard about these needs directly from affordable housing developers and policymakers, including those who serve on the partnership board. So thank you all for your contributions. I also wanna talk about the power of the partnerships design, this policy plus real estate. Financing can only take the ecosystem so far and policy sets the environment. The idea was really to bring both under the same umbrella. It takes both sides to create an enabling environment to help housing go from an idea to a home. And we also felt that we needed our two teams to be working together under one initiative, San Francisco Foundation and LISC to inform one another. So now that we have graduated the first cohort of policy fellows from the challenge grant, I've loved getting to know all of you. And we heard today about the 11 breakthrough grant awards and the fact that we have funded 30 projects. We're seeing the benefits of having the brick and mortar side and the policy side work side by side. We are happy to have witnessed the collaborative work between philanthropy, CDFIs, community organizations, government partners and developers all working together. So an example is that one of the first projects we financed was the Stewart Street Apartments, developed by Bay Area Community Land Trust and McGee Avenue Baptist Church. It was a project that showed the proof of concept for the soon to be voted on Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act legislation in Berkeley. So to recap, no matter how big this fund was, we wouldn't have been able to finance all of the demand. We wanted the funds to make catalytic change, to get projects going that could be proof of concept. We strove to be an example of what is possible so that you all and others could take up the work as well. We trusted our partners and we pushed CDFIs to understand risk better in affordable housing in order to embrace the new new models, new developers, new relationships to read beyond, reach beyond the expected and tried and true. We have supported new BIPOC-led and BIPOC-serving developers. We have supported organizations interested in wealth building and community ownership, such as land trusts. We've supported a mix of new construction and preservation projects at multiple scales. We have supported um, the emerging practice of small sites acquisition. We have supported affordable by design and other non litech models, including modular. And with all of this, now is not simply the time to pat ourselves on the back for a job well done. We need to push forward on this momentum, especially for going deep on racial equity. If you think of PBF's housing work as a tree and our roots are solid, we need to keep nourishing this tree to grow and for our tree to be connected to the other trees 
to grow this forest of equity. We see our work informing BAFA, we hope to partner with you, and connecting to Barhai's Black Housing Action Team and their work on a regional fund. And we invite you all to join us to create communities of opportunity and choice. And now, I'm thrilled to in introduce Lourdes Castro Ramirez, Secretary of the California Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency. Prior to this role, she was appointed by President Barack Obama to lead HUD's Office of Public and Indian Housing. She was president and CEO of the San Antonio Housing Authority and director at the LA City Housing Authority. She is an accomplished public servant and we are thrilled to have her with us today. And an additional thank you to Ruby Valeria Schifrin from CZI who extended the invitation to Secretary Castro Ramirez. I'll pass the mic. Thank you, Ruby, for the invitation. Y muchas felicidades. Happy third anniversary to the partnership. Congratulations on 3,000 affordable homes produced, preserved, and protected in just under 1,100 days. Your efforts are vital to keeping the Bay Area diverse and inclusive in a place where all people can thrive. And so I'm honored to be here today as Secretary of California's Business, Consumer Services, and Housing Agency, we share your mission and sense of urgency. We are partnering with communities and local governments up and down our Golden State to address housing insecurity and creating pathways for all Californians to have a place to call home. The Business, Consumer Services, and Housing Agency has many responsibilities, including coordinating across systems to prevent and end homelessness, expanding and preserving affordable housing, and promoting home ownership. I'd like to begin my remarks by sharing a letter that I recently received from Stephen, an eighth grader who lives in Simi Valley. Stephen begins by introducing himself and letting me know that he has two dogs and three brothers. Then he says, I appreciate all the things that you do for California and the housing. And I am writing to you because I am concerned on the percent of homeless people in California. He continues, this is an issue because there is tons of homeless people on the streets. And that is a problem because they won't be able to get jobs and won't be able to eat. So much empathy and compassion in these words from Stephen. He also describes a recent experience walking with his family on the streets of LA and the overwhelming sadness that he felt. He writes, I saw tons of people that don't have a place to sleep or stay. And he also includes data to support what he believes is a driver of this issue, housing costs. Quote, he says, the average price of a home in California is $727,370, and the average rent is $1,566. And finally, of course, he proposes a solution. My solution. My solution is to lower house and apartment prices by 25%, and build more apartment complexes. Stephen clearly understands the problem and he knows what it will take to solve the issue. He knows that stable housing is critical to the health and well being of our people, our communities, and our state. So I go back to this letter often to get, to get uh, grounded. Housing affordability and homelessness are two of California's most pressing challenges. Over half of California renters are paying more than 30% of their income on rent and utilities. Transportation costs are significantly higher for low income households, with many paying more than 20% of their take home check on transportation alone. And as we know, when a family pays too much on rent and transportation, there is no space to save for emergency. 
And what an incredible emergency we all have lived through over the last two years. The COVID-19 pandemic exposed deep-rooted housing inequities and exacerbated housing instability for our most economically vulnerable communities. And while the pandemic has been devastating with significant health and economic consequences, it also has been the great accelerator, giving us the opportunity to work together in new ways, making meaningful investments in short and long-term solutions. I joined the Newsom administration at the start of this public health emergency on March 2nd of 2020. And I can say that from day one, we have been working very closely with local partners to respond and to provide relief and to implement creative person-centered housing solutions. Housing for Californians like Rosa, who I recently met while visiting a home key site in Bakersfield. Rosa lived at a rundown motel for many years. She was extremely happy to see that that particular motel was purchased by the housing authority with home key funds and converted to permanent, decent, affordable housing with services and opportunity. Here, she not only found a home, but she also found sobriety with the help of her case manager, and now she's stably employed. She works for the Housing Authority as an on-site utility worker. Rosa is also a resident, resident leader at her home key community, where she empowers other residents with her own personal story. Her journey gives us hope and demonstrates that solving homelessness is attainable. So far, we have awarded $1.3 billion in home key funds to cities, counties, and housing authorities for the creation of nearly 8,000 affordable housing units. Home Key is just one of the programs that we have implemented to provide housing to individuals experiencing homelessness. It was born out of the very successful Project Room Key, which provided housing, emergency shelter housing, to nearly 50,000 people experiencing homelessness. We have also helped to prevent homelessness by helping to keep people in their homes. The state's rental relief program has prevented about 180,000 low-income renter households from being evicted. But still, this is not enough. Therefore, we must continue to expand affordable housing options and make up for the lost ground and years of federal and state disinvestment and structural racism in the housing system. Last year, the state committed an unprecedented $22 billion to fund housing and homelessness solutions through the governor's California Comeback Plan. The plan expands home key and accelerates the development of multifamily rental units with the Housing Accelerator Program. Just a few weeks ago, the state awarded housing accelerator funds to build 2,300 shovel-ready units, many of which will be built in the Bay Area and are expected to break ground this summer. So congratulations to you all. In this year's budget, Governor Gavin Newsom reaffirms the state's commitment to increase access to housing opportunity and to strengthen the alignment of our housing, equity, and climate goals by incentivizing housing that is close to transit, close to jobs, schools, and shops. And we are committed to continuing to plan with local governments and groups like the Partnership for the Bay's Future. In my response to Stephen, I told him that, like him, I also have two dogs, Capitan and Cooper, and that I am just as concerned as he is about people experiencing homelessness and that we're working hard with many others to find solutions. We must problem solve 
and innovate together because the moment requires us to be disruptors. California is taking bold action, implementing a comprehensive set of tools to boost housing production and address homelessness. Like Rosa and Steven, it is up to us to build a brighter future. A future where Californians have access to safe, stable, dignified places to call home and to have a sense of belonging. Let's work hand in hand to ensure that no one gets left behind and that every Californian has the opportunity to, tr to thrive in our great state. Muchisimas gracias and congratulations again. Thank you so much, Secretary Castro Ramirez. I hope you all heard her charge for us to coordinate across systems and really develop creative she called it creative person-centered solutions. You know, that young man she talked about, Stephen, clearly was wise beyond his years and provided us with a clear mandate, lower housing prices and build more. We look forward to working with you to innovate and disrupt our systems to serve everyone. So I've been seeing questions come in and it's uh, that time where we're gonna be addressing any questions, suggestions that you have. So, um, Cindy, I think we have a question for you. Sorry, yeah. I'm looking at the wrong screen. Yeah, I can read it out. <laughs> Great. Shelby King asks, are there any loan products or programs the team tried, found, found weren't a great fit and had to abandon or change? Um, so I have some ideas. We originally had a middle income mezzanine product. So... The Partnership for the Bay's Future Family of Funds spans very low income all the way up to 150% AMI to try to test middle income also. But what we found was that there wasn't as much need for financing or um, there was a different challenge. The challenge is that even middle income projects still need subsidy, but in this world of limited resources, there's very little or no subsidy dedicated to middle income projects. And so a financing product couldn't unlock that for those projects. I'll say one more thing. I was thinking about the faith-based and community-based pro um, product that we have is that advocacy for permanent sources is actually really important. Financing only helps if there's permanent sources as takeout. And so I'm making a plug for the Community Anti-Displacement Preservation Program. Um, the California Stable Homes Coalition is leading the charge to advocate for $500 million from the state. Um, and I hope we can all support. Thank you, Cindy. Um, Cindy, we have another question um, uh, from, uh, I uh, apologize if I'm saying this name wrong, Salshi Bass. And she asked, can you please share more information on the Black Housing Action Team? Yeah, so I um, I posted, I think everyone can see the answers. Uh, Melissa Jones is executive director of the Bay Area Regional Health Inequities Initiative, Bar High. Melissa is my contact for everything happening here. They are planning a two-part strategy, which is an, another $500 million regional fund and um, government investment in a set of local projects that are being driven forward by Black leaders. So big shout out to Melissa and Darius Young and Monet on that team um, and just happy to support them. Uh, and if you want to email us, maybe we can provide ways to get connected to that effort too. Wonderful. Thank you, Cindy. And um, we have a question from Michael Celier. Um, he said he would love to hear if we're proactively engaging the real estate leaders in San Francisco owners, developers, designers to solve this housing issue um, with free discounted services? I think, Michael, the short answer is yes. You know, as Fred mentioned in his um, opening, one of the key aspects of the partnership is that we're setting a large regional table to really understand and address these issues. We regularly talk to developers. Um, they're really critical in helping to even design the loan products that are necessary. Um, and uh, if you have other suggestions or if there's specific organizations that you think we should be engaging more deeply, please uh, share with us and email us um, that information. 
but um, you know, the uh, realtors and the real estate sector is critical to making sure that we're able to address the critical, uh, uh, the housing crisis. Thanks, Khan. Uh, there's a question here from Leslie. What other states are following suit with these programs? Khan, I know we've received a lot of interest of folks that want to learn from us. Um, yeah, we've talked to remember? you folks <laughs> yeah. throughout um, in different regions in Boston and Seattle in the Cleveland, Cincinnati area. We've also had inquiries from um, key partners, um, banking partners that are looking to adapt and adopt these types of frameworks for their work also. So I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity to replicate this model. It's something that we continue to build out um, use cases for and uh, build out the proof of concept. Our goal is to make sure we continue to share all the learning so that can be easily scaled both regionally and nationally. Yeah, I'll make a plug. LISC is going to release a paper, two reports next week um, with lessons learned thus far. There was also a request to see what was in the portfolio. It will be included in that report. And I also recall, um, I'll shout out the work of Melville Trust. They're working, their foundation working with HUD, also uh, pulling in parts of this um, model. Right. Cindy, I think we might just have room for one more. And there's a question asking what is the, the some of the most effective ways to combat opposition and NIMBYism to affordable housing? Oh man, this is a hard one, uh, a hard but easy one, right? Um, because I think, you know, one of the most effective and necessary ways to really approach those who don't wanna have affordable housing built in their community and their backyard is through a narrative approach. There are so many misunderstandings and misinformation about affordable housing um, and people here as housing wonks think that it's all common knowledge, right? I think I get, I fall into that trap sometimes. I just uh, sometimes think that what I know is what everyone else knows, but there's a lot of education to do on what affordable housing is and storytelling is really the key to that. Uh, we've been working with uh, nonprofit housing on narrative strategies to really combat opposition and NIMBYism. Um, they have developed a really great resource called Shift the Bay. It's, um, you can, uh, if you go to shiftthebay.org, you'll find uh, messaging guides, you'll find examples of campaigns, you'll find um, training materials on how we can better talk about, uh, the, uh, about the crisis, how we can really use field practice strategies and tactics um, and research-based messages that get people to join us in the fight, uh, uh, fight against, um, to join us in this effort versus getting defensive about it. So I really encourage you to look at those resources and tools, and again, thank uh, Nonprofit Housing um, for their incredible leadership in that work. I'll say one more thing here, Khan, which is a plug for the policy fellows. Please apply or send the application for the Breakthrough Grant Fellows. I think that having folks in our community that kind of work between government, community organizations, grassroots folks, Having those um, translators, if you will, that work in the middle, that's really important. And so the fellowship is a great opportunity to do that. And the more that we can grow these connective tissues in our ecosystem, um, the more that we can co collectively be pro-housing and um, combat the NIMBYism. That's a great point. That's a great point. And again, um, March 9th is the deadline for that. So and we're looking to recruit 11 new fellows for the Breakthrough Grant. So please, please, please consider applying. Um, and Cindy, I can't believe it. With that, we've come to the end of our convening. Um, for those who've joined us today, I hope you found it today as um, insightful. Um, I hope you found today insightful as you head back to working on equitable housing solutions, ensuring that everyone has a home, has the incredible potential to really transform lives and realize their full potential. We're so glad to be working us alongside you to build the public will necessary for policy change and housing investments. Together, I know we're making a difference and I would like to express my warmest thanks to Fred, to Denise, to Cindy, to Secretary Castro Ramirez and all of our partners for being a part of today. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you. Bye.